Welcome back to the Career Therapy Podcast, where we explore the intersection of work and well-being. I'm your host, Coach Marty, and each episode I interview mental health experts, coaches, and industry insiders to bring you practical insights and tips that will help you build a meaningful, rewarding, and sustainable career. So join me as we explore the path to career satisfaction, one conversation at a time. Today, we sit down with Dr. Jessica Jackson, a passionate practitioner, scholar, advocate in the field of counseling psychology. She divides her time between clinical practice, public speaking, advocacy, writing, and research to deliver culturally centered, evidence-based treatments to adult clients with a wide range of emotional, behavioral, and adjustment problems, including anxiety, stress, depression, and relationship issues. In this episode, we discuss how to manage our expectations and emotional reactions at work and in the job search, the importance of boundaries and how to implement them properly in the workplace, and how you can practice more self-compassion in order to better handle the ambiguity of work, life, and identity in the workplace. If you like the Career Therapy Podcast, please leave us a review on Spotify and iTunes, share this episode with a friend, or leave a comment on YouTube so we can help more people navigate their way to a better career. Additionally, if you have any career, job search, or mental health questions you'd like us to answer in future episodes, click on the send in a voice message link in the description of this episode on Spotify and iTunes to record your question and then tune into a future episode to hear our breakdown and response. That's all for the intro. Now let's dive into this week's conversation with Dr. Jessica Jackson. All right, Dr. Jackson, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm really excited to chat with you about your work in culturally centered therapy. And I'd love to just, you know, start off very broad, give us a little bit of a background of how you got into the world of mental health. Well, thank you for the welcome, Martin. I'm excited to be here to have a conversation with you today. Um, I got into the field of mental health, I, I, I like to say almost by accident. Um, in college, I was, I have a, a family history of people being teachers. My sister's a teacher. My mom is a teacher. My grandma was a teacher. So I was in school to be an English teacher, um, English secondary education. I had taken the first praxis and a requirement was to take a psychology course. And I took one psychology course um, toward the end of like my sophomore year and fell in love and changed my major much to my parents' dismay. I was already like halfway through. Um, and I was like, oh, I want I want to go to school like for psychology. And of course, everyone's like, what do you, what job do you get with that? <laughs> Had no clue. Still did this. Still did the degree. Um, graduated an extra semester late um, and then went on to grad school. And so that was a question that came up for me a lot is like, what job are you going to have? And, you know, in grad school for me, it became clear I wanted to be a psychologist. Um, you could become a licensed therapist or social worker or anything. Um, and what even became clearer to me is thinking about having conversations about mental health. And so for me, from the beginning, my work has been about destigmatizing um, and not just teaching people what it means to destigmatize just by being in the space as a Black woman psychologist, um, being present, I'm destigmatizing. Um, less than 4% of all psychologists in the U.S. are Black. You can imagine that only part of that 4% are women. So just by showing up, I'm helping people to see that this is a space, this is a service that's available for them. I love that. And what are some of the stigmas that are out there that's maybe have changed or haven't changed over time that you're, you know, hoping to, you know, normalize and help people become more comfortable with? Yeah, I think one of the more general stigmas, I laugh with people all of the time, um, what we see on TV is not what therapy is like at all. So often in movies or even on television shows, they'll show people, and I get it's like comedic relief, um, but they'll show people going to like lay on a couch or somebody asking them like, like, tell me about your childhood. And that is not therapy at all. So I've actually had people who come in and they're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do or where to start. I'm like, just tell me why you came in. We don't need to start when you're eight, you know? Um, and I think that's one of the things is people feel like, oh, if I come into therapy, I have to start from an early age and I have to go really deep. And that's not true. Like you're coming in because there's something that is not working out in life the way you want it. So whether it is conflict, intimate partner conflict or work stress, or you notice you just feel different, you're eating less, your sleeping has changed. Like, I think that that is the one of the largest stigmas is like we have to start from so far back. Um I know another one, especially in my community, is like we don't tell our business. So then people come and they're like, 
I'm talking about my mom or my dad or my grandma in this way that doesn't feel like respectful or good or what we're taught is respectful or good. Um, and I think that's a barrier for many people and helping them to understand that therapy isn't really a, a space where we're here to judge. It's a place of exploration. Um, what does your relationship mean? How is it impacting you? So we're not really here to say qualitatively your mom or dad is good or bad. We're here to say like, how did who they are influence what's happening with you? And so I think the stigma is people feel like, oh, if I go in here, I have to say bad things about my family members. No, if it comes up, sure, there's space, but that's not really our, our goal. So I think those are like two of the biggest ones that I often see. Yeah, it's really starting with that understanding piece. And then the, as a therapist, kind of meeting people where they're at rather than forcing them in any one direction, right? Um, and I think that's right. also a change that I've been hearing a lot in the therapy world from this uh, kind of more just, you know, explore yourself kind of approach to a more, um, you know, working on a problem. It's it's almost like a, a bit of an overlap between some of the like old school therapy thinking and the new school coaching field work and really trying to help people, you know, problem solve with a lot of these skills that you can build in this space. Is that what you're seeing as well? Or how are you seeing it play out? Yeah, I, I think you really kind of summed up what it means to process. Um, people hear that word in therapy all the time, like you have to process the event or we're processing in therapy and it feels this very nebulous, I don't know what it means, but that's what it is. It's like, I'm just exploring how it impacted me. What does this mean for me? Um, I'm, you know, not necessarily to your point, trying to figure out a solution or solving what happened, but I'm acknowledging it. Um, and for us as humans, like how many people during the course of a day have the space to stop and think about like, oh, this argument with my coworker really upset me. What, what was that about? Where did that come from? Right. Um, why did I feel like that was such a, a stressful conversation or experience? We don't have that space. And so therapy is really giving us that space. If we solve things along the way, great. Um, but I don't really look at us as humans as something to solve. It's more like navigating the complexity of our emotions, really understanding what is happening when we're experiencing an emotion. That distinction between solving and navigating, I think, is a huge one. And, you know, as we get into our conversation here about, you know, culture and work and things like that, um, it's an important distinction because a lot of times the conversation is centered about fixing things, right? A lot of what we're trying to do is fix a lot of things. And I think that that fixing creates unrealistic expectations. It also creates a lot of, um, I, in a recent podcast I was working on with some, or talking with someone on, um, they were talking about expectation. And when you have so much expectation for how things could be, it actually almost, ex you know, makes the things that are real, the reality, the messiness of things much more painful uh, because the expectation, and the reality are not matching. And sometimes a lot, you know, what we're working on in these processes is adjusting expectations while also still trying to navigate and work on and develop and, and all that kind of stuff. So how have you seen, um, you know, that expectation people's expectations either help or hurt as they're trying to navigate these uh, complex situations? Oh, man. Martin, I think that's like a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> they might all be. <laughs> you know, I, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm like, what? Um, so I think there there's a both and, right? We, mm -hmm. we call that the dialectic and we like... Um, because I think you need to have expectations. Um, it's how you define what something is. If I have an expectation of a friend, that's how I decide somebody's a friend versus stranger. So if my expectation is that friends are people who can listen to me, then that's how I distinguish like this person is a stranger. They are not a friend. They do not listen to what's happening. This person is a friend. They listen. And I think sometimes when we have what are considered like unhealthy expectations, I don't even like to qualify them as unrealistic because who gets to determine what is possible for you, right? Um, but I think unhealthy expectations, then that's when it becomes a detriment. So using that same example, if I then expect that my friend not only listens to me, but they have dinner with me once a week and they always answer the phone when I call and they're always there when I need them, like that's not healthy. That's a lot of responsibility I've put on that person. Um, and so then, yes, I'm going to feel disappointed because the other person is human too. Things are happening in their lives. They may not answer when I call. They may need time to themselves. 
they may not have capacity to help me navigate what I'm going through. And so if I then say, well, you can't be my friend because I have all of these unhealthy expectations, I might not have any friends. So I think it's really a spectrum when we think about expectation. And so really learning how to, um, to ride, I don't even like balance, like ride the fluidity of it. Like there's going to be, you know, sometimes we should have higher expectations. Sometimes we should be able to say like, this is not healthy. Like that's a lot of responsibility on that person to be in relationship with me. And I think that that plays into our experiences at work quite often, right? Uh, when I'm working with people in the job search, there's so much emphasis on the internet and in the media about finding a dream job or, you know, finding that mission driven, purposeful thing in your life that's going to, and, and, you know, as people, as people who work in a field that they really enjoy, it's like, even, even as a coach, it's hard to wake up every day and be like, I'm 110%. Like it's, it's just not realistic, right. Or it's not um, maybe a healthy view to think you're always going to be that way. And that sort of um, build up and let down, uh, you know, I've seen it in a lot of different ways where people do think that they found, you know, maybe their dream role, but then they're in it for three to six months. And all of a sudden they start to see the flaws. They start to see the the cracks in, in the system and, and things that maybe seemed really amazing on day one, you know, the reality, the messiness comes out. Um, how have you seen uh, the workplace affect people and their sort of views of work impact the way that they can show up on a daily basis or or be impacted by the environments that they're in? Yeah, I mean, similar to you, even as a psychologist, like there are times when I don't, I, I too, I'm like, I don't want to get up and do this. I would like to lay here and go to sleep or go on vacation. Um, even if you, and I love what I do um, and I feel passionate about it, it's still a job. Anything that we feel like obligated to, like I, I don't get to do it on my own schedule. I don't get to say, oh, I'm only coming in at two today and leaving at five. Like that, that is not what I get to do. And so even when I don't feel like it, I need to get up and do my job. And so I think that there, you know, one of the changes I've seen, especially over the past few years, is there's all of this talk about how much time of our lives we spend at work. There was even this meme that was on social media at one point that was like, you know, the amount of time we spend at work is far outweighs the amount of time we spend with our family and friends since we have to treasure it. If you're spending, you know, 40 hours plus a week at work, that is a lot of time. So then I feel like people feel they have to have this pressure you know, I have to find a space that I can be my best self, be authentic. I can thrive. It's my dream space because I'm spending so much time there. Um, and I don't know that that actually exists. There isn't anything that comes that doesn't have its challenges. And so then I think what happens is when we have such a, a high, unhealthy expectation of what our job and how it should fulfill us, um, the disappointment can be so great. And that's when you start to find people feeling less motivated and they're automatically on to the next role or... They're feeling like, where did I go wrong? How did I miss this? How did I mess up? And so I actually think finding a job is almost like how we look at relationships. It's going to take a while for you to figure out what am I willing to be okay with? And when am I saying this is an absolute non-negotiable, right? When we date, there are people that we find might be incredible. And then they do something like, I, I actually can't just live with that. Like, I cannot live with that. Maybe it's if you want children and the person you're dating doesn't want children you're like that's a non-negotiable it doesn't mean that you missed something or did something wrong it's just saying like this is not something that I could live with for the rest of my life the same way in the workplace if we start to think about it like what are things that I absolutely need to have to be able to stay here for a long period of time and what are things that I'm like mm, I don't like this schedule but like I can do it for a period of time you know um, I think that can help us with you know how our what we're expecting from the job and then how motivated we feel from it. I don't know if that feels relatable, that analogy for you. A hundred percent. Because, you know, I see it all the time where, you know, you help someone find something and they're so excited for the job. Right. And you're like, I just know in the back of my head, I'm like, just wait six months. Oh, <laughs> it's not going to feel so good, but I'm glad you have a job right now. And I don't want to hamper your day, but like, also in six months, you know, watch out. And uh, the reality will come fast. And I always try to like help people um, 
especially during the job search process when maybe they're putting a company on a pedestal or they're looking at it like it's this like, oh my gosh, I could never work there. It's this amazing place. It's like, bring it down a notch. Like this company is probably not as cool or as great as you think it is. It's just another company, right? And I think I think that's where, again, we kind of have to go back and forth with these thoughts because that that's a thought that could easily go, well, if every company sucks, why even try, right? And then we can fall on the other side of, of the... Uh, you know, being disheartened by the whole process versus, you know, having a kind of what we're talking about here, maybe a realistic or a, just a healthy outlook on some of these things. Um, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to dealing with the reality of the workplace, which I think is where a lot of people have a lot of tension and struggle um, because maybe they, again, are stuck in this, it should be this way kind of mindset, or they want to make changes. Um, but then they start to experience the the difficulties, the hardships of being in a work environment and having to have, you know, coworker relationships and and boss dynamics and and things like that. Um, there's a lot of pressure around either changing your office environment and like putting a lot of effort into, you know, I'm going to come in and I the company should do it this way, or maybe you even join some internal groups to help you know, adjust the culture or things like that. And then there's also a whole other school of thought that focuses on like the company is what the company is and you have to change yourself to fit it kind of thing. And obviously it's, it's a both and kind of a thing. Right. Um, so how do you sort of approach your therapy or the conversations you have in work environments from both that individual and systemic uh, view and, and where do you tend to put your focus or help people um, navigate that's those conversations? You know, I tend to put my focus on the individual and, you know, listening to you, one of the first things that came up for me is like, I often help people to understand that things are on a continuum, um, the way that we change, right? So what I might've been willing to deal with at work when I was 25, or even what my dream job was at 25 is going to look different at 35. And so they're like, I'm constantly changing. So I also have to recognize that I'm not changing in a vacuum where I work is going to be constantly changing and on that same evolution we might be at different points in how we're changing and I think that's where the misalignment happens it's like oh I'm I expect a b and c I expect them to be uh, more supportive toward my mental health I expect them to be more uh, further along in their DEIB efforts than where they are um, without realizing that maybe five years ago I wasn't in that same spot right so like I'm expecting them to be where I'm at and so for a workplace that has multiple people in it, they're trying to fit everybody. Um, and I don't know that there's any one workplace that does it right for everyone. I don't know if that even exists. And so I think for individuals, then it becomes like, well, what's important to you? And like, what do you have in your control? What don't you have in your control? And how do we kind of explore if this is so misaligned with your values, maybe we do need to move on or maybe it's an opportunity for you to figure out like what are conversations I need to have to figure out if this is going to be able to meet my needs. I don't know that it's always about changing. Um, I do find that the system is harder to change um, because it, it's kind of at the whim you think about, I mean, in the past, what, two years, how many different quiet words have we heard? Quiet quitting, quiet firing, quiet hiring. <laughs> like the, the workplace is at the whim of all of these kind of whatever is happening in the world. And so like trying to constantly change that all the time, I feel like that would just feel like an effort and futility often. So then it becomes like more about what I can do. Um, and then how can I maybe impact systemic change? I don't think it's it's quite, we don't do it. Um, I, I look at burnout, for example. I don't see burnout as an individual issue completely. It is a systemic issue. There are things that people in leadership can do, but again, recognizing like just because I change or impact one workplace does not mean the next place I go is not going to have the same issue with burnout because it is it's larger than even each individual company. Well, and it could be even team by team right? You fix burnout on right. one team with five people on it, and then you get moved to another team six months later, and they're a totally different a totally different thing. And that's where when I talk to people about what kind of jobs they want, and they say, oh, well, I want to find a culture that I fit in. It's such a difficult starting point because the culture of a company changes person by person, team by team. You know, I, I remember the first company I worked in, you had 
we had totally different buildings. Like, you know, this building with the international team had a totally different culture than this building with the marketing team and this building with the finance team or this floor even with these people on it. And so um, trying to, you know, again, change all those things versus maybe being adaptable or flexible while also pushing, you know, boundaries where you can is, is definitely, um, it's almost like a tightrope walk that a lot of people have to walk and, and figure out the right way to do it. Uh, let's dig into burnout a little bit, because it is such a big thing that comes up in, in these conversations. Um, could you give a little bit more of an explanation of how burnout is both a systemic issue and a personal issue and how maybe the solutions that are being thrown out are maybe not such good solutions or, or alternatives that could be better ways to think about this that might actually help people? Because it does seem like the burnout conversation, a lot of the solutions to burnout just create more burnout. What are your thoughts around that? <laughs> Agreed. I, I agree <laughs> with that. Um, it just creates more burnout. I agree because people are essentially when someone is feeling experiencing burnout, they're saying I'm reaching capacity. So when someone is like, well, here's what you do. It's like, I just said I'm reaching capacity and now you're giving me something else to do. I, I don't know that that's going to help. Um, so I do see burnout. I actually had an article recently um, talking about looking at the difference between burnout and moral injury. And this and this is not going to apply to everyone. Um, but for some people in some professions, is it really, you know, I just can't do this work anymore that I'm feeling like I don't have the resources that I am feeling like it's too much work? Or is it that that's a misalignment with my values when I am expected to make decisions you think about for people in our um, healthcare workforce during COVID who had to make decisions on who got a ventilator and who didn't because you didn't have enough? That is not necessarily burnout. That is like you are, that is a lot of pressure. And you're constantly feeling like this does not represent who I want to be in the world at all. It's a constant tension that can be exhausting. Um, I think when we also think about burnout, you hear a lot of people who are saying we can do more with less. What does that mean for your employees? Um, and the word that always comes up to me when I think about burnout being systemic is productivity. And people are like, are you being productive? And I'm like, well, you're not a product, you're a human. You were not created to produce. Right. Um, and so when we look at yeah, the workspace in that way of like productivity levels, we are taking kind of the humanness out of it. And I think that's what where we get with burnout when people are like, I have been going too hard, too long um, and it's not sustainable. And so I think then companies have to look at how are we giving people appropriate time to complete work? How are we even for companies with unlimited PTO? What is the culture around taking that? What is the culture around taking bereavement? Um, the number of people have seen go have to go back to work after they lost a loved one. And during the past several years, that was a lot of the country um, because of COVID. And so if you're going back to work, even if it's on your computer at home, five days after you just buried a parent, like that, I mean, that to me is something a workplace should be able to say, no, we give people this much time off, right? Not you need to request it. You need to ne navigate it, negotiate it. Um, I think from an individual standpoint, work does take up a lot of our lives. Um, and as someone who I enjoy work, um, I also have to recognize what are the things that pour back into me, right? Um, one of the, the journeys that I'm doing this year, my word for the year is rejuvenation. And rejuvenation is the after process of kind of rebuilding. And I think about it like, how do we pour back into? So if you give a lot at work, what is your outlet to get poured back into, um, and then we get to the, the buzzword of the past two years, self-care. Um, I, I don't believe there's a wrong way to self-care. So pouring, if, how you get poured back into is like, I, I carve out time to read a book, a fiction book, three times a week. I work out a bubble bath. I don't think there's a wrong way to self-care. And I do believe you cannot self-care your way out of burnout. That's also not sustainable, right? So then thinking about, well, how am I creating boundaries? So yes, the, reading the book is helpful, but it's more about boundaries that I have carved out this time for myself. That's the bigger lesson. It's not that I'm actually reading a book, then that helps me. It's that I have carved out time for myself. And so when I work with people, I'm always like, yes, do all of the things for self-care that take care of you, that pour back into you. But also let's look at how we can almost, lack of a better word, scale this up. What does this actually mean? It's more about you setting boundaries for yourself. It's more about you taking care of yourself before you take care of everyone else. Um, so I think on an individual le level, we do have some accountability to do some of that work for ourselves. 
You've hit on so many great points here. Okay. <laughs> I want to dig into all of them at the same time. Um, when it comes to uh, the idea of, you know, pouring back into ourselves, that relates to a, a great conversation we had on another podcast about feeding all of our identities um, and really just kind of, you know, I like the nuance that you put to it where it's not necessarily the action. Because in that podcast, we were talking about like, go to a, a play or go to a concert or things like that. It was all very action focused. But what you're saying, it's it's more about carving out that time and prioritizing. And there's almost something even more deep to that than just like, oh, I went to a movie tonight. Uh, the depth of it is I'm respecting myself. I'm creating boundaries for myself. I then feel like I can actually have autonomy in other ways and I can stand up for myself in other ways and then maybe push back on that project or delegate that task or different things like that. Because it does start to sort of create a feedback loop in either direction, right? If we're never saying no to things and we're just taking on more and more and more, burning out over and over and over again, that leads to a cycle where we can't stop doing that. It almost becomes, you know, we we kind of lose that muscle to be able to push back. Whereas, you know, saying I am going to go home at 5 PM and go do this yoga class or whatever it is. It's the boundary of going home at 5 PM that you're holding, not necessarily the yoga class. Um, that's just a great reason to leave <laughs> or something like that. Um, and so as we do think about this self-care piece um, and creating boundaries, what happens when your boundaries aren't respected at work, um, either in small ways or in big ways? And how can people, uh, how have you seen that show up in people's work and how have they navigated it in either positive or difficult ways? Yeah, I think setting boundaries, navigating boundaries is probably honestly a lifelong lesson. Um, and it's a lesson we don't start to learn until we're in a space where we feel like there aren't any, right? It's almost like how we treat mental health in America. We wait till it's a crisis and then we're like, oh, I need to use this skill. We haven't practiced the muscle, the arm and the, you know, tried it. Um, and there will be people who will not respect your boundaries, who will test your boundaries. I think a part of understanding boundaries is a part of aligning, like, what are your values? And I think this is the piece that gets skipped when we start thinking about boundaries. Um, and I tell, you know, I work with clients all the time and, I, and even for myself, I'm like, don't make something an issue that's not an issue. So using your example, if I'm leaving at 5 p.m. to go to yoga class and I'm saying that's my boundary, and then my boss is saying, no, we need you to stay till six, right? The first time maybe not a problem. But then it starts to become, oh, it's happening all the time. I ask clients, I'm like, do you actually mind working till six? Or is it just because you told them no, that now, and they're pushing it, that that's the issue, right? Because there's two different issues. If you don't actually mind working till six, because you're like, well, I can come in later. And that actually works better for my schedule. It's not really them not respecting your boundaries. But what happens is we get upset because then we're saying, well, they're not hearing what I'm saying. I'm like, well, a part of it is, is it a firm boundary for you? So they might not recognize because you're saying, okay, every time that this is a firm boundary, because it's not really an issue. The issue is that you're feeling like I told them something, they're not respecting it. That becomes a whole other issue. Whereas if you're saying, no, this is important to me that I make it, that I leave here at five, then it becomes a conversation of like, have you explained to them? Has there been a conversation of why this is important? And there's an alternative solution we can come up with together. I can't stay till six, but if I know in advance that you're going to need this, I can be working on it earlier in the day. Or I can't stay till six, but I can come in earlier tomorrow to work on this because we need it. Because my boundary is not that you're like asking me to do it. It's actually that I cannot work past six. That's what I'm saying. That's my boundary. And I think sometimes we get, we often conflate the issues and we're like, it's not even really a problem that I have to work till six. I don't mind working till six. My problem is that they're not listening to the fact I said I couldn't. So now I'm going to make this the issue. And then it's harder to find a solution because the person you're talking to doesn't really know what the issue is. They're like, okay, fine. Uh, you can't work past six. Like now what? Right. And they're like, fine. They listen. It didn't get solved because they're still going to ask you to do the work. <laughs> it still has to get right. done. Right. 
Well, yeah. and I see that I see that playing like that's where the relationship stuff comes into play as well, where it's like, you know, you hear these stories of, uh, you know, a couple is arguing you know, about this thing, that thing, the the laundry, the the dishes. But it's really something deeper that's not being discussed. That's the real issue. And um, that's kind of what you're saying here. It's like, is it the 5 p.m.? Is it the fact that, you know, they didn't hit the deadline? Is it X, Y or Z? Or is it something much deeper that needs to be addressed where uh, and what I tend to see is when people are trying to learn these skills because they wait until they're in a crisis mode to learn them, they overcorrect, right? And so I'll see someone who is not good at setting boundaries or not good at standing up for themselves and a recruiter will like ghost them or something. And then they go, well, this is because I never stand up for, and they have like, you know, 30 years of, of, <laughs> of emotional baggage. And they're like, I'm going to just bring it all to this email that I send to this mother ever. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and, 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 uh, or, or like the passive aggressiveness comes out or whatever it might be. And it's a, uh, it's an overcorrection because you're not skilled in, in doing those things. And I think that that's where therapy and the tools of therapy and, and coaching can come into play to help people build these skills in smaller, less intense situations over time. So that when something egregious happens, or even when something minor happens, you respond to it with the appropriate amount of pushback or response or acceptance or whatever the thing might be. Um, have you seen uh, that sort of overcorrection in your work and how have you helped people adjust their uh, maybe emotional or or internal responses when they do try to set a boundary and it's not respected or they do try to you know implement some sort of change at work and it's not you know uh, well received or something like that how how have people dealt with that emotionally um, and calmed themselves down or found a way forward? Yeah, um, I absolutely see it, um, the overcorrection for a lot of people. And I go back to the point of like, you know, our feelings are valid, but they're not facts. And that's what I tell people, um, right? Like, okay, you you are very upset with them about this. Like that is a valid feeling, but you're making an assumption about why they did it. And that's what your emotion is based on. And that's not a fact, right? So you you're angry, it's valid. That's how you're feeling, but it doesn't make it true that you should be angry or that that is the response for this. Um, and it really comes down to communication. And so, you know, I have a great example of this because I think we don't, as adults, everyone thinks they're a great communicator. The number of people who come up to me and they're like, I am great at, like, I know how to communicate my needs and, and, you know, and the, as an aside, I do believe um, if you have to tell me what you are, that means I can't see it on my own. So probably <laughs> you're not as great at it think you are right that's just in my general when people come up they're like I am amazing at this I'm like well I should just be able to see that if you have to tell me um but when it comes to communication people think they're great communicators and so in a great example that I give is thinking about using the term I love you because this is something that happens all the time and I was like so if I'm telling whether it's a family member a partner anyone if I say I love you and they respond back thanks and then I'm upset I have to think about my communication pattern did I just want them to know? In which case, them saying thanks is the appropriate response. I just wanted them to know I got my needs met. But if in fact, what I was saying is, I want you to tell me that you love me, I didn't communicate that. I said, I love you. I expected that they would say, I love you back. And that was an expectation, right? That I put placed on them. They did not do that. And then I'm upset. And I'm like, well, you don't love me. And I'm like, well, that's not how we, that's an assumption from this interaction. We didn't communicate, hey, I actually need to hear that I'm loved right now. That's totally different. And we do the same thing in the workplace. So am I communicating something and assuming that they should just get it? And then when they're not giving me what I need, then I'm frustrated. I'm like, so you just don't value me. You just don't see it. Or am I actually communicating what the need is? And many of us feel hesitancy. It may, again, it's a skill we may not have practiced. We may feel afraid, like, you know, we're afraid of rejection. But I'm like, you're also getting rejection when you don't communicate what you want, you don't get it, you're still not getting what you need, right? Either way, you're still not getting what you need. Why not practice it? Um, and I put very plainly, I call it naming a thing a thing. Let's name it so we know what we're talking about, the same thing, and then we can have a conversation from there. I love that. And, you know, there's 
there's so much in that in regards to the job search as well, where, you know, I had someone ask me on a group call yesterday. They were like, you know, I was having someone reach out to me from a CEO reached out to me and said that they wanted to set up a time to chat. So then I responded and then they responded and then I responded again and then they ghosted me. And I'm like, well, how long has it been? And they're like two days. I'm like, that's not ghosting yet. <laughs> and then I'm like, well, what are you, what are you interpreting the quote unquote ghosting as? And they were like, you know, mm -hmm. went into all their insecurities and all the things that, oh, this person thinks that of me, or maybe I did something wrong and now they're upset with me or whatever it might be. And then I said, can you send me the screenshots of this interaction? And the second message mm -hmm. from the CEO was, I'm incredibly busy right now. What time can we meet? Can you please send over like a really specific time? And the person responded with, here's a link to my like calendar. And I was like, well... Sending a CEO a link to a calendar is an overwhelming experience for them because then they have to open it and look at it and compare it versus just having like one time that they can say yes or no to. And so that could just be an adjustment in the communication style that would maybe lead to mm -hmm. a quote unquote better outcome. And a lot of this stuff, um, I try to compare it for folks to like, you know, mass marketing, right? Like if you're going to apply to a job on a job board, that's like putting a billboard up or putting like an advertisement on Facebook. You're not going to get a, a huge number of responses. And so we need to adjust our expectations accordingly, right? Because if we think sending in five applications should lead to five interviews, well, that's going to really hurt when we don't get that response. Or when we think having this conversation with someone is going to lead to the outcome we want because we tried to have that conversation, it's putting a lot of pressure on that one instance to get the outcome that we want. And so I do like that you're like, it's not, you, you can't just assume that these things are going to happen. You have to maybe even try a few times or try a few different ways or really get to the core of and naming what it is that you want to see. Because if you're vague in any way, shape or form, people aren't going to get it. And I think that's such an interesting thing. It's like people don't get it. Like they just, they they hear the words, but they're distracted. They're thinking yeah. about like the, for, the, the traffic on the way to work or something. And uh, when you are trying to name the thing, what are... What are, what do you think gets in the way? Like, what do you think makes it hard for people to actually get down to saying, I, I need to, I need to hear that I'm loved or something, or I need to hear that you appreciate me at work. Like, why, why is it so hard for people to just ask for those things straight up? It, it might seem obvious to ask this question, but I'm really curious what your thoughts are. Why is it so hard to ask for the thing you actually need versus what most people try to do, which is dance around the topic and hope that you get the response you want? I think I, we're, we're not necessarily taught this skill. Like we have to think about how we're socialized. And I think this comes down to culture, right? And some cultures and some families, you weren't really socialized to ask for your needs. It was always like consider other people's needs. And so we don't get that experience, that skill. Um, but I think we also have gotten just to a point in society where we assume that people think we're speaking the same language. We don't define things. Um, and I have like a slightly funny story about that, like taking the word innovation. How many people use the word innovation? What does it mean? Um, I had applied for this role at a tech company. It was, a, you know, years ago, two, three years ago. And uh, I thought like reading the job description, it felt very, very innovative. Um, and I was like, oh, this is exactly what I'm looking for. This is what I want to do. I like applied. I got the interview. I got the first interview. And I was like, oh, like this. You know, in the interview, I was like, huh, this doesn't quite sound like what they described. So I got all the way to the final interview and the hiring manager in the final interview, which I will forever appreciate his transparency, basically told me, he's like, you're too advanced for this job. Like how you're thinking about innovation, like the things that you're thinking about, we're not doing here. And he was like, this moves very slow. This was very. And so the thing is, we had been using, you know, throughout the whole the whole process, we were, I was thinking we're on the same page about innovation. And he essentially was like, no. And he was very honest. He was like, I think that you will not enjoy this role. He's like, it's not that I don't think you're a good fit. I would want to hire you. I can tell that you are not going to enjoy it because what you're thinking of, we are not even there yet. And I was like, oh, I probably should have asked this earlier. Like really, what does innovation mean to you all? What does it mean to be cutting edge? Um, because it meant something different. And so I'm like, we could have saved a whole lot of time, a whole lot of the process. Um, but a part of it is, I think, I never asked, they never brought it up. 
Um, and for someone like myself, I consider myself having the skill. So then I had to think about what was the other thing. And I think this is for many people. We don't like to not be liked. We don't like rejection. So we don't want to ask a question. And then somebody say something like, you're not a good fit, right? Realistically, a part of me is like, my pride is hurt. I would rather you have an offer on the table and I get to decline that because that means you wanted me than for you to tell me you're not even going to make an offer because you don't feel like I'm a good fit. Reality is that's really good information that's helpful for me, save this all time. But my pride piece is like, nope, I'd rather have the offer, right? And I think this happens in the job search. There are people who would rather say, I got multiple interviews than to say I got one interview that was the right job, it was the right fit because I knew what I needed when I went in and we were able to have a communication. We don't like to say I only got offered one interview. Um, we like to be able to say, I got multiple interviews, multiple offers, but none of them worked out. Right. And how kind of that person to say that to you, because then you could actually respond to it. They didn't just have it in their head and then not bring it up and then turn you down for the role because they thought that you were too advanced and then you don't know why you didn't get the job. They actually brought it up to you. And you, if you wanted to in the moment, you could have been like, well, that's okay. I'm actually looking for a slower environment or I'm looking for whatever, if that was the case. Or you could say, you're absolutely right. This isn't right for me. And you can have that conversation. I guess that goes right back to the naming the thing, right? That person named a thing and you were both able to respond appropriately and see if it could it could work. And I think this brings us to, um, you know, I was going through some of your articles and you're talking about fostering an environment of psychological safety at work. And I think getting down to the, the you know, verbiage that we use, I think that can mean a lot of different things to different people. And I'm curious, how are you, how do you view that in the workplace? And what do you think either leaders or employees could do to help foster those environments and create safer spaces for conversations like this, where people are kind of coming in nervous or heated or, or lost and, and really want to be able to have more honest to the point conversations. Because a lot of corporate speak is very <laughs> dancing around the topic. So how can we maybe cut through some of the corporate mm -hmm. speak and, and start having these real conversations? Yeah, I think about when a company has created a psychologically safe space, in my opinion, it's like they've created a buffet. Um, you know, at a buffet, you get to go and you get to choose what you want to eat. You get to choose where you sit. Like there's a lot of choices. Um, and I feel the same way when a company is, has a psychologically safe environment, I get to choose how I show up, right? I get to decide which part of my identities I want to come to work as. Um, I get to choose like, you know what? I'm more of an introvert. I want to be a little bit quieter and no one is going to say, oh, she's not doing well at her job because she doesn't speak up because maybe I communicate in a different way. Or maybe I get to show up for me as a black woman wearing however I want to wear my hair and no one's going to make a comment about like, oh, that's different or something like that. It's like, it just is what it is, right? There's all of these ways. And so when a company has created a space, people feel like I get to choose how I want to present here versus I think a lot of companies are trying to create this space, um, but they, they micromanage it so much that people still don't feel like they're like, ah, I can only really show up in this way. Otherwise, people are going to say something. I'm going to have to answer questions. I'm going to have to do all of these things. Um, to me, it is the same way of like um, attributing with the number of people who say, I want to be authentically myself at work. And I'm like, not true. It's a lie. You don't. <laughs> um, you like most people are not even authentic with the people in their lives that they see on a daily basis. Like the number of people who are like, my partner doesn't know this about me. <laughs> right. And I'm like, but you're going to show up to work like that. Like, that's not realistic. I think what people are saying is I want the freedom to be whoever I want to be. So if I want to wear a certain type of clothing at work, if I want to, you know, share any of my social identities, whether it's my sexual orientation or my ethnicity or even a disability, that I feel comfortable doing that. That's what I think people want is the freedom, not necessarily that they want to be as authentically who they self who they are. Because I'm like, there are a few spaces that we are that way. That's actually a very sacred thing to expect that from work. You know, you're not, even if they told you, you could, if you even felt it, are you really going to tell them, you know, actually I'm on the job hunt for a brand new job. Like that mm. would be you being authentic. You're not saying that, right? Like you are, you're still not going to show up authentically even, you know? And so I think when companies create this space, they're saying we have created a space where you have the freedom to choose how you're presenting today. You can wear heels, you can wear flats, you can wear a sweaty, a hood, like a hoodie, or you can wear like um, a cardigan. You can wear your hair however you want. If you sh disclose that you have a disability, it doesn't change anything. People are saying, okay, how do we accommodate that? Not thinking, 
now we have to change a project and accommodate this person. Like they've created a space where people get to choose what they want to bring. I love that you put that out there because the authenticity conversation comes up so much. And especially when people are trying to find a job and they're like, I just want to be authentic. So I'm telling them that I don't have this skill, but I could learn it. But I, and I'm like, now you're just coming off as desperate. And it's like, and then, you know, I've had a recruiter on who's like, never be desperate, never show. Or she, what did she say? She said, you can be desperate, just never show desperation. <laughs> um, and I find that to be so funny because it's like, um, to your point, we're not even authentic necessarily with our family or with like, like, you know, close friends and things like that. Heck, I would even go so far as to say, you're probably not even truly authentic with yourself. A lot of the time you have these ideas of who you are, you have these, uh, you know, assumptions of what you could be, but a lot of that is not rooted in reality. I was listening to a talk yesterday and the person was like, we only know 5% of who we are. And boy, isn't that nice? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> they're like, why would you want to know any more? Life is hard enough. And I was like, that's such a weird way to look at it. But it's also kind of funny. Um, it is like, they were kind of talking in a very cosmic term. But you know, that's, that's a whole different story. But uh, there's so much interesting stuff in that authenticity, and it can get in our way. And, and I think it goes back to a lot of the things that we've been talking about where it's like, um, oh, I need to stand up for myself at work because I need to really, and then you like go too hard with the standing up for yourself and you create more problems. Well, I guess it felt authentic to do that, right? It felt like you had to do that, but that's where I think maybe slowing down and allowing some space between the emotional reactions and the actions is really important and really kind of allowing ourselves time to what you said earlier, process before you know, taking a step in a certain direction and, and maybe even there's a, a start and a stop and a, and a push and a pull there. Um, but when it comes to these different tensions, both internally with companies, with cultures, with environments, with authenticity, um, how do you, how do you help people navigate these different tensions? Are there any tools or mindsets or ways that we can maybe reframe uh, in order to be able to show up in these different ways and and be able to even know what identities we want to bring into the office and which ones maybe we we don't want to show as much or not be as raw about yeah i mean i i believe that you said it when you said you know we don't even always know our ourselves right um we might know who we think we are um and i think that's important and the thing that i hammer home the hardest um which i think is most difficult for people people to accept myself included um, is acceptance. Um, it is really hard for us to accept that things may not be what we think they are. And so even for th something like authenticity, I'm like, it's actually not static. We talk about it in a very static way all of the time, but it's actually more fluid, right? What feels authentic to me as I grow and change is also going to grow and change. So maybe authenticity to me this week, it, you know, maybe I'm like, I want the freedom to wear whatever I want to wear. And I might wear it for a while. And then I'm like, cause I just want to wear jeans. And then something happens. And all of a sudden I'm like, I wear, I really like dresses. I don't even wear jeans anymore, but I fought really, really hard to be able to wear jeans at the workplace, but I don't even wear them anymore. Right. And so recognizing that we are constantly growing and changing, that means how I think like what it, what authenticity means to us is constantly growing and changing who we are is constantly changing. Um, and so I'm like, the hardest part for many people is acceptance because they're like, no, I am this person. And I'm like, yes, today in this moment. Um, but what if you're not? And they're like, I'm never going to do such and such. I'm like, maybe um, you don't know because you're not there yet. Um, and I think it's really hard for us to recognize because we need a little bit of stability and that, you know, it's almost like decentering a little bit of like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to like in a few years or a few months or a few weeks. And so that feels scary and said, you know, maybe I, I will say like, you know, when people are self-describing and they say like, I'm strong and I'm like, okay, again, back to what we were saying earlier, what does that mean? Um, it probably is going to mean something different to you over time. So yes, you can be strong, but like, what does it mean to be authentically strong now? What does it mean to be authentically strong in six months? That's going to change for you. And so, you know, I think the deeper part of that is then we judge people based on what their authenticity is. And so I think if we can reduce that judging, we can then accept that we're all changing. So I'm not judging what somebody's authentic is because it's going to change for me too. And so I think it's just really hard for us to sit in that much gray area about ourselves 
just as humans. Um, we like to think that we know who we are. Um, we don't, I, you know, I had a mentor once, you know, who said, you're never as good as you, as they say you are, you're never as bad as you say you are. Right. And I'm like, that, what does that mean? But I'm like, it's true. It's so hard to sit in that. Like, we're really just average. <laughs> like we're really <laughs> always in the middle. Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Career Therapy's Unstuck Coaching Program, which was built to give you the personalized support you need to advance in your career without fear and turn work-related anxiety into professional accomplishments. When you enroll in the Unstuck Coaching Program's monthly membership, you get immediate access to all of the coaching resources you need to crush it in your job search. This includes two one-on-one -on -one calls with Coach Marty every month, weekly job search support group sessions with the Unstuck community, access to the Unstuck curriculum, which guides you through every aspect of your job search from strategy through negotiations, and an invite to the Career Therapy Slack channel where you can chat with Coach Marty whenever job search questions come up. Want to see if the Unstuck Coaching Program is right for you? Head over to careertherapy.com and schedule a free consultation with me in order to find out. I love that we're really just average. And I think that that's, um, gosh, if I get to just have that be the whole theme of everything at Career Therapy, like um, there's nothing wrong with average and everyone wants to be above average, but then it's like, but then no one's, that doesn't, even, you can't even calculate that. So um, I do find that a lot of this stuff, when it comes down to it, I it is just gray. A lot of this stuff is just gray the way you're saying. And, um, you know, there's this pressure, I think, from, I guess, some corporate cultures, there's pressure from a uh, so societal perspective, pressure from a uh, social media perspective to be a consistent thing. And that I think is where it becomes really hard for people. And I almost wonder if like, I don't know, a hundred years ago, this was maybe even easier to be more uh, accepting of the gray because you didn't have to present as much of a brand, like personal branding wasn't a phrase, you know? Um, or maybe it was just as hard because you had social structures in the community where people expected you to be a certain way. Uh, who knows? I, I wasn't there. But um, these these are some really interesting things because at the end of the day, um, we get trapped in these uh, almost caricatures of ourself, right? We We get a job title and then that becomes our identity. And then we start to sort of drift into that being everything about us, right? Uh, you know, even as I've been studying, you know, uh, to become a therapist, or I've been a coach, like, I just see it sort of bleeding into every part of my life. And I'm like, okay, wait a second, put some boundaries around this stuff so that you can just like hang out with people without like psychoanalyzing everything. Um, or you'll, you know, I have a lot of brothers who are lawyers, and I'm like, can we have a conversation that isn't a debate? <laughs> like, you know, and, uh, and so you find this stuff just bleeds into everything. Um, and then it really hurts people because if they get laid off, they lose a huge sense of their identity, right? And so, you know, knowing that not only are identities not consistent and change every, you know, day, month, year, uh, but also knowing that there's many different identities within us. And it's all about, in a lot of ways, what are we expressing at different times? And and how do we evolve with that and grow with that and learn from that and interact with that? Um, if there was, as we get to the close of the conversation here, if there was something that you could leave someone with so that they could maybe find a way to calm their reactivity or anxiety around uh, an imperfect workplace, what what tips might you share with them so that they can continue to show up in the variety of ways. And and I like how you said that. It's almost like riding that wave, right? What are some tips that can help people as they're riding that wave? Because the downslope of the wave can get pretty scary for people. How can they manage that fear and continue to be, to continue to show up when the environment is, is so uh, fluid around them? Um, Self-compassion. That is something I'm actively practicing. Um, I encourage so many people people to do it. One of the components of self-compassion, there's like three that kind of make up self-compassion is our common humanity. And I think just a reminder sometimes that I'm not the only person experiencing this. 
um, we give compassion to a lot of people, but not to ourselves. And I think that's because we get in our head. And so sometimes I just have to say, like, you did the best you could with what you had. The end. Like, there, you know, I can always in hindsight say what I could have done better. Absolutely. But also I, there has to be a recognition. I couldn't have done better. I did what I could with what I had, right? Like now, after the fact, I have additional information. I can see how I could have done better. In the moment, I didn't have that information. And so I think that we kind of beat ourselves up sometimes and say, I have to show up this way or that way. And just having self-compassion. Sometimes we don't show up in the way that we want to. That's okay. We can we can forgive ourselves and say, you know what? I didn't, you know, I, I didn't give myself what I needed in that moment. And does it suck? Yes. Can I get that moment back? No. Can I change something going forward? And so for myself, I know sometimes I get frustrated and like, oh, they got to me. I didn't want to show up that way. And I have to, you know, tell myself, like, let me give yourself what you need, a little bit of pat on the back. I give myself pep talks and there's self-compassion, mindfulness. And um, uh, Kristen Neff, she does a lot of work in this. She's a psychologist out of Austin, Texas. Um, she's even done some books on it, like some self-help kind of books on self-compassion that I highly recommend. But I think that that is really, for me, the key for, for a lot of what we're dealing with, especially in the workplace, is sometimes we just need to tell ourselves, right? Give ourselves some of the compassion, whatever you would say to a friend. Like, yeah, that sucks. Maybe I need to take a minute. And so we're constantly like, no, I can be resilient. I can do better. It's like, no, it sucks. It's okay that it sucks. <laughs> like, let me give myself a minute to let it suck. You know, um, that is that is the thing that I would give to most people. I, I wish that we, all of us, myself included, had more compassion for ourselves. I think it would make it a little bit easier to be human um, and a little bit easier to then be as authentic as we want to be because we feel like we have the space to do that. I love it. It's okay that it sucks. What a great, what a great phrase to end on for a combo here today. Um, hey, if you're out there and you're going through the job search and it sucks, it's okay. It sucks for everyone. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, if folks want to follow along and see what you're working on, Dr. Jackson, where can they go to find more of your work? Um, definitely LinkedIn. Um, it, you know, LinkedIn, you have your name. It's not like all the other ones. We have a username, uh, Twitter, original Dr. J for all my sports fans. They'll understand that. Um, and same thing on Instagram. I go on Instagram. I'm Dr. J Lauren, which is my private practice and consultation services, um, Instagram. Um, but feel free to check it out. Feel free to connect. Um, and I wish you all some self-compassion, including you, Martin. I hope you have some self-compassion this week. I'll do my best. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. And, uh, man, I just, I hope people take this and, and practice that self-care and compassion. Um, thank you again for being here today. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for today's episode. If you found this conversation to be helpful, please like and subscribe wherever you are listening. We also appreciate it if you take the time to leave us a review on iTunes. It really does help us spread the word and get these ideas out to more job seekers looking to build their careers and improve their lives just like you. If you'd like to learn more about career therapy and see our different coaching options, you can head over to careertherapy.com to learn more. Thank you again for stopping by. We wish you all the best in the future of your career. Have a good one.